Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and my apologies for the late start. We had some gremlins in the works here. Welcome to this SIE Cybersecurity Chapter webinar, where they'll be discussing maintaining and remediating the cloud, improving security posture regarding industrial environments. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this web webinar will be made available on the SIE TV channel on YouTube. The registration link is in the chat function. Please subscribe, it's free. And this recording of this webinar will be under the cybersecurity chapter playlist. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to introduce you now to our host for tonight, Mr. Lengasi Musarai. He is the Vice Chairman of the SIE Cybersecurity Chapter. Lengasi has eight years of working experience in various industries, including roles in administration, project management, banking, supply chain, and ICT consulting. Having worked in various companies ranging from small and medium enterprises to two well-established corporates in South Africa, he has had exposure to different business functions and industries. In addition to completing undergraduate studies in business management, he has acquired an MBA and master's cybersecurity programs. Currently working as a cybersecurity specialist, he aims to use the skills acquired to advise and coach on company strategies with a specific focus on securing the data, networks and systems within companies. Over to you, Lingasi. Thank you, Minx, and uh, good evening to all our guests and speakers. Welcome to the latest webinar event from the SAE Cybersecurity Chapter. The event is titled Maintaining and Remediating the Cloud with a specific reference to the industrial environments. My name is Lengasim Zirai, and I am the Vice Chair of the Cybersecurity Chapter. Cloud computing services continue to rise in popularity, and there has been an increased increase from organizations in the major cloud service providers, such as AWS, Microsoft Azure, Alibaba Cloud, and IBM, amongst others. This is due to more and more organizations continuing to not only consider, but invest in this approach to uh, solving their IT needs. Further fueled by the work from home measures introduced by companies due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, this is not a silver bullet towards secure computing, as even though cloud service providers and companies have put security measures in place to protect data, threat actors will attempt to breach organizations nonetheless. This requires IT and engineering practitioners to think about ways to maintain and remediate their cloud infrastructure in the never-ending bid to improve their security posture. The cloud refers to the delivery of on-demand computing services that are accessible via the internet from a remotely located data center or server, usually on a pay-per-use basis. Some advantages of the cloud include managing less physical infrastructure, unlimited data storage, ease of scalability, accessibility of cloud com uh, computing services from virtually anywhere, provided that you have access to the internet, and possibly less cost, depending on the licensing and setup of your various cloud this or this, your options on-prem. Some disadvantages of cloud computing include denial of service attacks, tech vulnerabilities, possible downtime, limited control in comparison to an on-prem solution, uh, accessibility or lack thereof to skilled labor, and the inability to access information without an internet connection. Despite the increased popularity, opponents to cloud computing adoption often argue that it may be more suitable to start up organizations than established organizations or industrial environments with legacy systems and sensitive OT infrastructure. Furthermore, there is an increased attack surface when organizations adopt the cloud, technology fatigue, and placing products and services on one cloud provider can result in a single point of failure, 
while having a multi-cloud strategy will bring added complexity and possible compatibility issues. This event will address some of the ways organizations, particularly those in the industrial sector, can approach their cloud computing while meeting their security needs. The agenda today involves three speakers, each with a unique presentation and a panel discussion. After the panel discussion, we will open the floor to attendees to ask questions within the Q&A chat box. You are welcome to direct your questions to any member of the panel or pose it to the panel collectively and anyone who wants to address can do so accordingly. Our speakers today collectively have over 25 years of experience within private and public sectors or industries. First up, we have Dr. Jabum Dre. Dr. Jabu is the head of information and cybersecurity at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR. He's a research fellow at the University of South Africa and a technical leader of the National Policy Data Observatory. Dr. Mtrani led, supported, and implemented large complex ICT and ICTD4 projects in large state-owned enterprises in South Africa and Africa, uh, Africa at large. Government departments and private sector. His research interests and technical expertise are digital security, digital transformation, data science, cybersecurity, and cyber crimes. He regularly speaks at various local and international conferences on various technological issues. He has over 18 years of academic and industrial experience working with local, regional, and international industries and partners. He has published over 70 peer reviewed conferences and journal articles with several collaborators. He completed his first Comrades Marathon in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jabun Dwayne, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see me. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and thank you uh, to the uh, participants of, of this particular webinar. I will be talking about building cybersecurity capability, particularly for industry clouds. And I will explain that briefly, uh, what we mean by industry clouds. In terms of uh, the industry clouds, let me just show the pointer. In terms of the, the industry clouds, I will deal with it in this context where I'll just provide some background so that we understand what we are talking about. Uh, since the concept of industry clouds might not be uh, familiar to everyone, but I'm sure by the end of this talk, everyone would have a better idea of what we are talking about. And then we'll also deal with the, our security perspectives when it comes to industry clouds because that actually determines how we go about remediating in the cloud and obviously improving the security posture. We will also uh, deal with obviously the core takeaway of this presentation, which is the issue of how do we go about building a cybersecurity capability for industry clouds, both internally and externally. And then from there, we will deal with the summary. In terms of the, the industry clouds, obviously this is um, based on the various needs and um, of different organizations as we continue with the digital transformation journeys, as businesses modernize their various processes, as the infrastructure becomes sort of merged uh, in, in, in very different ways. And it is obviously very clear that uh, the cloud computing you know, is becoming increasingly important. We know, obviously, even with the pandemic. When we look at various studies, such as the one done by F5 in 2021, uh, it is indicated that at least half of the organizations are accelerating their cloud deployments, obviously, to deal with the, the various needs of the, of, the mode, of the mode work modalities. There are multi-cloud strategies that organizations are, are, are you know, are, adopting, for example, using different service providers of cloud in order to serve their different needs. But the industry cloud strategies are also gaining traction, particularly for those specialized industries, in order to satisfy 
the different uh, requirements across the different sectors, and we'll deal with that very shortly. Obviously, as we go, you know, adopt multi-cloud and industry cloud, this brings with it some several challenges, particularly when it comes to the risks uh, from the cyber perspective and also the threats as well. And we will deal with the type of uh, the critical infrastructure sectors later on that are suited for multi-cloud and industry clouds. So when we look at the industry clouds, obviously many people will ask the question, what do we mean by these industry clouds? You know, is this just another new terminology or is it a new type of a cloud? But in simpler terms, industry clouds are clouds that are customized to fit a specific industry. And the reason they are customized is because certain industries, for example, if you look at the financial sector or the health sector or the energy sector, we may find that they have some specific regulatory requirements that may not be suited by the general public clouds or even for that matter, private clouds. So the industry clouds then are specialized where they would focus on the tools, they will focus on the APIs, they will focus even on the governance and the compliance of that specific industry. So when we look at industry cloud, it's sort of cloud computing specialized fully for a particular business. As you can see there, in order to accommodate the legal, regulatory, and the security consideration, for example, you may have companies, or organizations that want to keep some of their data in the cloud, but also keep some of their data on premise, or uh, they want to include other aspects within the cloud uh, platform, for example, embedded systems, if let's say we are talking about the energy sector, or in the financial sector, they may want to use this cloud depending on where their clients are based in, 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 in a customized way. As we would know, when it comes to cloud uh, computing, there are various layers where organization can operate. And generally, if it's a public cloud, we know that it's automatically operated at the cloud layer where your data is sitting at the remote data center. For example, it might be Azure, it might be you know, AWS or others as well. But sometimes uh, the requirements of specific organizations require that organizations need to operate in an integrated way, but at the fork layer, in other words, where the processing may be happening, for example, in an Internet of Things or in some sensor that is sitting uh, maybe in the field and it cannot constantly be connected to the remote data center. So you find that other organization may then adopt these two strategies of having the cloud layer and the fork layer. But when it comes to industry clouds, then you find that there are other organizations, let's take an example of an electric company, where they may have embedded system or a water company where they may have pump on the field, but they still want to monitor them, maybe remotely or something like that. So where we have what we call a mist layer. And then of course, depending on uh, the structure of the organization, you may have the edge layer. So what the industry clouds do, they accommodate all of them, obviously you know, taking into consideration the specifics of those industries. Of course, Industry clouds, they generally use the same uh, kind of like tactics uh, that we are being used now, even with the public or private clouds. But the benefits of, 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 of industry clouds is that they transform legacy operations. So you find that there are organizations that are sort of um, uh, not akin to adopting the normal cloud, and they would want you know, solutions to be tailored to fit in their legacy operations, as we indicated maybe they are using embedded systems quite often, so they would want the cloud to accommodate that. But also industry clouds are very good at enabling digital transformation within organizations much faster than you know, when you just get a generic cloud. Obviously, in terms of driving business agility, making sure that the organization can still uh, you know, transform, but uh, keep to the regulatory requirements and obviously other compliance requirements that might be required in the specific jurisdictions. And then the other key thing is now organizations could have embedded systems, as an example, and still increase their intelligence and real-time data using the cloud without necessarily compromising uh, probably the critical infrastructure, such as the one that might be controlling pumps and stuff like that. The other core component, you know, when we think about digital cloud, industry clouds, is the issue of data sovereignty. 
In other ways, there are organizations like in South Africa, maybe where organizations used to comply to property, let's say it's a retail sector or the financial sector, where they are collecting a lot of data from um, different entities and organizations. Uh, so uh, what will then be required is that the data must stay in a country like South Africa. So with the industry cloud, that could be easily made possible. Obviously, the other aspect is the issue of cybersecurity capability, that when you have these industry clouds, the provider could already tailor your cybersecurity capability for your organization, including maybe access control and all those other requirements. However, this comes with a number of challenges. For example, when it comes to multi-cloud management with industry cloud, it becomes a little bit tricky because industry cloud are specifically tailor, uh, tailored. So if you are going to use different service providers, you are going to have a little bit of a challenge in terms of uh, using these multiple clouds. So you might find yourself having you know, single point of failures. You might also have diverse vulnerabilities in this case because uh, your industry cloud is tailored to your organization. So you don't have the, the, now the opportunity of having access to these common vulnerabilities. Of course, you know, because we are using the same technologies, you will still probably have some visibility in terms of the others. The third party application integration is another component that can be tricky, particularly in an organization that uses IT, IoT, you know, and OT uh, technologies, because that requires very specific, you know, sometimes protocols that needs to be integrated across these different systems. So when we're using industry clouds, that could also be a challenge, but industry clouds are actually meant to solve that, uh, but it requires a lot of, of more effort. Of course, the other issue is the issues of reliability, and we know with clouds in general, uh, because of if everything is in the cloud layer, reliability uh, could be an issue when there's a single point of failure. But when your cloud is uh, multi-layered, uh, you could then even try and, and avoid some of these. And then the security of legacy applications, just because you are using an industry cloud, it does not mean the security uh, vulnerabilities of the legacy applications goes away, and that still needs to be taken care of by the organization. And I will explain why we then talk about building the cybersecurity capability for both internal and external. Because sometimes when people adopt the cloud or even industry cloud, they will make an assumption that the service provider will then take care of all the security dynamics. But if you're using a multi-layer uh, 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 industry cloud, the key thing is that in the fork layer, in the mist layer, and the edge layer, you are still responsible for the security of that. Maybe your service provider might still deal with this, but we know that when the data is in transit, you still obviously have to ensure that you are using secure homes and stuff like that. Hence, we also talk about the challenge of security roles and responsibilities, because some people or organization might think that by having industry cloud, by default, your, your security problems, they go away. Obviously, the issues of network and data security remains the same, even with other clouds, particularly when uh, uh, um, your cloud provider is even outside the country or even if it's inside the country but uh, in terms of uh, where if you're using public networks and stuff like that in terms of our perspective because generally you know in the in the, in the cyber security space people look at terms in different ways and uh, the arena of cyber security is quite diverse so with different capabilities and skills requirements for example if somebody is just dealing with it security and their cloud is generally dealing with IT technologies, then generally people will be at this level. But you might find organizations such as your energy sector or manufacturing, where there's both hardware and software that needs to be dealt with. You might want to be looking at the IT security, the OT security, including physical security. You know, so that obviously gives even more requirements and uh, it influence on how we build on the capabilities for securing the industry cloud. And then, of course, depending on whether you are on the defense, generally public organizations will be on the defense, in other words, protecting their systems. But if you find other organizations such as your military and, uh, and, 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 and the law enforcement, if they adopt industry cloud, the approach is a little bit different there. And then, as I indicated as well, you have to consider you have IoT, you know, within your environment, sensors in the, in, in the field that needs to be monitored or that needs to form part of this cloud. And then ultimately, that will determine, you know, this operational environment will determine how 
uh, your, your industry cloud will be, uh, will be secure. And then it's also very important that even when a stakeholder or an industry is adopting um, and this industry cloud, they clearly define what the security focus would be across these various perspectives, because it is possible that you could have a cloud that just deals only with IT security for your, for, for, for your data that is in the cloud, but the OT security and physical security, you still have to deal with that internally. And then in terms of uh, the security, if, when we, we, we zoom in now into the security for industry clouds, I normally show this picture that there are three dimensions, you know, when we talk about how we improve the security posture of, um, of the industry clouds or in, in, in any way of any other uh, information system. There are three components, people, processes, and technology. Sometimes we can tend to say technology, because when you talk about industry cloud, it's generally technology uh, is going to solve our problem, but you still need processes, you still need people. And if any of these elements are missing, then you have what we call cyber insecurity, whether it's in the industry cloud or even in a, in a, in a, in a normal cloud. And the reason for this is that the cyber security landscape is forever changing. So if you have the technology, but you don't have the people, you might have a technology that might not necessarily uh, protect you. Uh, and uh, it's also then, as I've already made the point, critical to build this uh, internal cybersecurity capability, you know, capability which is not just technology, but it includes a number of dimensions which I will, I will touch on as I, as I close. And then the other core component, because when we adopt the cloud, yes, we might be saving ourselves the cost, and then we don't invest in cybersecurity skills internally uh, due to various reasons, you know, and stuff like that. But we know that if we do that, we are going to be exposing ourselves uh, or relegating the responsibility of security to the cloud providers. And, um, and, and, and I've made this point that without that, uh, those sufficient skills, it is just impossible uh, to remediate or even maintain or even you know, implement any other security capability in the cloud. And it's also very important because sometimes people focus on uh, on, on compliance, uh, but compliance is not equal to security. Just because we have passed the audit, it does not mean you are uh, you are secure. And then the next point that I want to deal with is the issue of um, uh, uh, the capabilities that are required in the cloud or for industry cloud. And generally, these would uh, happen even in the cloud, in the edge, in the fork, in the mist environments, as I've shown earlier, uh, and also in the environments. Uh, you know, where there is even not a cloud. But what is important uh, in order to promote security posture in these specialized clouds is organizations, one, needs to at least define what are some of these processes or activities you know, that would be happening across these different layers, because that tells what needs to be protected uh, by the cloud provider, what needs to be protected by the internal organization, what are other uh, capabilities that probably needs to be outsourced, to even the third party uh, service providers. And then the other critical thing is the understanding the critical technology environment. Is everything critical? Generally, it's not possible that everything is critical, but organizations sometimes, when they deploy some of these clouds, they think everything is important. It's generally not possible. But then we need to decide whether you are going to uh, focus more on uh, protecting you know, maybe financial systems more. Uh, or the embedded systems or the IoT systems and stuff like that. And at what maturity will that be happening? Uh, because that can also be informed by understanding the risks and the threat landscape. In other words, uh, across these different critical environments, what is the, the, the risk of each and the threat landscape? They're generally not having the same landscape. It's therefore important, particularly when it comes to investing into building these capabilities and then uh, and, and, and defining obviously what could be supported internally, as I've mentioned, uh, the multi-cloud security strategy, when you consider that, looking at the various service providers, in, uh, local, foreign, and also looking at the aspects of national security. For example, if it is the, uh, an electric or an energy company, you might want to think very carefully when you outsource you know, to the multi-cloud strategy looking at where is your service provider, what are the relationship with the service provider with your country, and things like those, because that cannot be ignored, particularly from the supply chain point of view and nation state, you know, geopolitical uh, dimensions. And then, of course, there are very other considerations such as security skills. There's quite a lot of them in order to ensure that whether you are 
adopting the industry cloud, you have the capabilities as defined by NIST in order to identify vulnerabilities within your organization, protect you know, the various assets within your organization through threat prevention, detect you know, uh, incidences as they happen, and whether they are happening in the cloud or they're happening within your edge uh, computing environment, you should have the capability to be able to detect that. The service provider is not always going to do that for you. Uh, you must be able to respond because incidents, indeed, they are going to happen. Uh, so you must be able to detect them and respond and obviously be able to conduct investigation or outsource those and then obviously be able to, uh, to, to recover as well. And then uh, in terms of the skills, we know it's very, very critical. And uh, as you could see here, the cloud security is a very high growing skills, including the development of secure applications and risk management. So it's very important in your organization that some of these skills, even if it's not many, particularly if you're adopting the cloud, you must have specialists who, who can at least assist you uh, to ensure that your industry cloud is, um, is secure. And obviously, we must remember that some of these skills are in demand and uh, they are very, very uh, costly. And uh, when it comes to industry clouds, one thing that needs to be realized as well is that you even require more specialized skills. And what do we mean by this? If, for example, it's in the, it's in the energy sector and uh, it's an industry cloud, you need people, for example, engineers who understand that environment, particularly from the, uh, from the, the embedded systems point of view. Uh, if it's in the health sector, you also need people who may understand the regulations in the health sector. Because just because being a cybersecurity specialist does not mean you are able to, for example, operate in a military environment unless you understand the specific uh, environment. And then as I close, this is actually the, 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 the core thing of how do we then go about building a cybersecurity uh, a capability driven approach for, security, for securing this industry cloud. And, and this framework applies to, to, to almost everything. Uh, and any an environment. This is what we call an integrated capability management. I've already spoken about processes, people, and technology, but the other core thing is the issues of context and environment. And industry cloud, they focus on that because protecting the information when you're in the retail sector or protecting the information when it's in the financial sector, for example, Reserve Bank, it, it requires completely different approach uh, with regards to uh, the protection of that. And that is why the issues of uh, the threat and, and the risk assessment become very, very key because each and every environment is facing uh, a different uh, uh, threats. And then, of course, a, a whole capability, we have what we call a posted fit. Uh, nowadays, it's posted fit with L, and I will share that now briefly, where when you are building a capability, just having a technology alone is not enough. As I did indicate, you need personnel, but the organization itself needs to be suitable to support industry cloud, you must have support systems. And by support systems, we talk about the entire value chain of the organization from HR, finance, you know, logistics, uh, security, and, and so on and so forth. Because sometimes you may have the technology, but uh, you find that uh, the, the weakest link is probably maybe at the reception or something like that. Hence, the whole support system needs to, uh, needs, needs to be part of, of, of the capability. The issues of training, they play a very big role, building capacity. And sometimes organizations think that people become security experts by default, but it requires training, it requires development. The issues of equipment is very, very key. Simple example, you can't have a server, even if it's big in your environment and not have, for example, a, a, a air conditioning, because that could be your downfall. Issues of governance, they play a very big role. Where the facilities are at, you know, secure facilities, you know, for example, if you look at, at organizations like as X, 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 ESCOM, uh, they are a different facility in terms of protection and security. If you look at the South African Reserve Bank as well, completely different to maybe a retail store. The issues of information that has been processed, uh, we need to look at that as well. And then, of course, we can talk about all of these, but if there's no money, there's no budget, your industry cloud will always be very limited because it's also very specialized, so you need to have some investment into it. But, of course, the other core two things that sometimes we forget about is the issues of leadership and the issues of strategy, because if uh, there's no leadership to drive some of these things, you may have the technology because uh, the, the service providers have sold it to us, but you may not be fully realizing it. And if you don't also have a strategy about the industry cloud, where do you want to implement it? How do you want to implement it? For how long and when? Sometimes you will be following 
the strategy of the vendors than yourself. So it's also very critical to have that uh, core uh, integrated cyber uh, uh, um, security capability management. In terms of conclusion, uh, we can talk a lot about this, and as you can hear, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, stuff we can say about industry cloud, because indeed they provide a number of benefits, especially for organizations that are, are very complex, uh, particularly military, that may not just uh, adopt any other cloud, whether it's private or public, but they want specialized one due to their operations, uh, but they come with dynamic security challenges that we need to also look at. And uh, also, we must always remember that just because you are protected today, it does not mean tomorrow you will be. Uh, hence, you know, threats and risks are very dynamic. They are evolving. A technology alone would not be able to solve them. Uh, and, and that is why uh, the, the industry sectors that are considering industry clouds should not delegate the responsibility to the cloud provider as they journey into the digital transformation. Building strategic capabilities and skills is very important and critical particularly in promoting the security posture. I thank you very much, and then we will uh, take the questions and answer them later. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Jabu. Um, that presentation really highlighted the need for us to adopt a cybersecurity capability-driven approach in securing the cloud and specifically having individuals who understand the environment while organizations should actually take the time to actually upskill their employees in order to, 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 to be ready. Thank you. Now moving on to Dr. Daniel Ramuzuela. Daniel was previously a lecturer in the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Computer Engineering since 2016 at UP as part of the Advanced Sensor Networks Research Group. He's currently a lecturer at the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Cape Town. Daniel served on the advisory committee of Telcom Center for Connected Intelligence in the research group, the Departmental Teaching and Learning Committee, and the Faculty Curriculum Transformation Committee. He also served as a mentor for NSPERS students and ISFAP students within the Department and MasterCard Foundation across the, the faculty. His research interests include system security, machine learning, and wireless sensor networks, focusing on IoT applications and cyber physical systems. He has served on international conferences, organizing and technical program committees, and has also published extensively in leading international journals and conference proceedings. Over to you, Dr. Daniel. Thank you. Daniel, can you hear us? Daniel, can you hear us? Okay, sorry. Yeah, this has had just uh, frozen my screen. Hang on. There you go. Hey, can you hear me? I hope so. Yes, thank you. Yes. All good. Okay. Let me share your screen. Come on. There we go. Okay. Um, let's get on with the presentation. As I said, I am Daniel Ramutsuela. And I am going to be talking about intrusion detection uh, in the cyber physical uh, cloud applications. As we've heard from the, the, the previous presenter, Dr. Jabu, um, we are moving towards more clouds, uh, the, the cloud uh, integration. So, how are we going to react when these systems are inevitably compromised? And that is what I'm going to uh, venture to answer in my uh, presentation. So, 
let's uh, go ahead. So cyber physical systems are going to be an integral part of these uh, smart cities of the future. Uh, that is uh, generally where we're headed uh, right now, especially now when we're dealing with these critical infrastructure applications. We want them to uh, be more efficient. And if we want people to be able to access them easier, well, the people that are supposed to be able to access these, these things, we want them to have easier access so that they don't necessarily need to be in the room. And also we have uh, perhaps service providers that aren't necessarily always going to be around. So the whole uh, development around these cyber physical systems was not only around the, the, the intelligent uh, monitoring, but the remote aspect was also very important. But now, obviously, companies are preferring to outsource a lot of the computing capabilities uh, because this is going to be a bit more efficient and, and less expensive and you can scale up and down as necessary without needing to, to worry about uh, the hardware and maintaining all of that. You could simply, the companies could simply decide, well, instead of handling all of this uh, ourselves, let's rather use a, an external uh, service provider. So. The cyber physical cloud, which is which is becoming increasingly popular, is a, a cyber physical system uh, that has the cloud as its backbone for computation and communication. This could happen at very at various different levels, uh, but we will discuss that later because the, the the company could outsource all of that completely, or just certain components like perhaps um, you're going to have a lot of data. Let's rather uh, instead of dealing with all of that, put the data elsewhere and we'll, we'll process that offline later on and then we'll have our real-time system uh, separately. But that could happen at, at, at various different levels uh, at this uh, cyber physical cloud. But unlike other cloud applications, these cyber physical systems have real world implications if they are compromised. Uh, the environment could be uh, affected, the amount of money involved there, it's not just a, a situation of somebody's, uh, uh, some pictures that you may not want out there, it's not just a situation that somebody was able to access your pictures. Some of these things could really have uh, devastating consequences, especially when we're dealing with these um, critical infrastructure applications so because of this, uh, preventative mechanisms alone are not enough. Uh, you can spend all the money you want, uh, but these preventative mechanisms, are it's not guaranteed that you're going to be able to keep people uh, out of the system, right? The solution to this is to make sure that we, we adequately invest in intrusion detection systems. Well, the more broader term is going to be the intrusion detection and prevention systems um, in order for us to be able to, once an attack has happened, what then? What are our options? Are, are we able to handle situations like that? So these are the, the, the kinds of things uh, that need to be considered here. So a cyber physical system has this very long uh, 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 definition, textbook definition over here, which pretty much boils down to two things, right? Uh, the software is going to be used to interact with the physical environment. And when we're dealing with software in this sense, this could be, as I've said in the previous slide, intelligence, you can add intelligence over here. There's a, there's a heavier emphasis uh, uh, on the software being the brains of the operation and is going to take your data and interact with the physical environment in some way. Right, and this is tightly integrated with the internet uh, as well. So this is a very, very important part of these cyber physical systems because the the rise has coincided with the, the development of these uh, communication technologies as well, and these industrial control networks are starting to look very similar to the the corporate networks as well, whereas they used to be uh, quite uh, apart. This is obviously going to increase uh, the, the, the convenience, but also the vulnerability as well, right? It, it's convenient. Uh, you're going to have intelligent monitoring and control over here. Uh, we can remotely access all of this information. Uh, our engineers don't necessarily need to be on there. If you call up your engineer or plant manager at midnight, uh, they may not necessarily be able need to drive out. Um, I, I had, uh, there was a situation uh, where I was with my friend, uh, for example, who works at a plant and 
when he was called, we were abroad at the time, when they gave him a call, he had to coach the person using the phone because the, the, the system was completely detached from the internet as most systems are. So all he could do at that point is via a phone, try to coach the technicians to see if they could figure out what was wrong. But obviously now we're moving towards a more integrated uh, society and the system. So uh, we do, the world is moving forward. This is going to happen, whether it's happening now or later. Uh, for your company, you can decide, well, let's rather wait it out. But yeah, it, it is going to happen. But this is obviously going to increase those vulnerabilities. And, uh, and now we should then look at why we should care, because this is this is certainly going to, uh, let's look at uh, one of my favorite examples of this. Uh, it, it's a bit old, but it, it just shows how devastating it could be if somebody is able to get in, uh, especially in these critical infrastructure applications. So there was a, in March of 2000, a, a water treatment facility in uh, Maruchi in Queensland, Australia was compromised, right? So the attacker seized control of 150 pump stations remotely and released 1 million liters of untreated sewage into local waterways, right? So by the time he was caught, this is the amount of damage he was able to, to cause, right? And these local waterways was the water that was used as the drinking water. The amount of money it took uh, to, to reverse all of this, never mind uh, the, the plant life and, 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 and the animals that were relying on this water, uh, you can see how devastating this was. The system did have security mechanisms in place as well. So how is it, because uh, it was a fairly new plant, just recently upgraded at the time, and it did have uh, the best security money could buy at the time as well. So how, how is it that this person was able to get through? Well, the attacker was somebody who was actually involved in the installation for upgrades into the system. So when they were upgrading the system, the company that they had outsourced to do this, the attacker had worked there, uh, right? So he was involved in, 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 in that upgrade of the system. So he had an intimate knowledge of exactly how the system worked and used the knowledge to bypass the security mechanisms. And at the time, the system did exhibit unexplained behavior, um, which the engineers did notice. But uh, by the time they noticed, as we can see, 1 million liters was released into the uh, local waterways and, and the cost to both the, the, the environment and the municipality was, was, was a lot at, at the time. And, 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 and for interest sake, the attacker did this because after being, after being involved in, in those upgrades, he wanted to work at the facility. They said no, he was angry. And, and, and this is why he was able to attack uh, the system and, and cause this, this amount of damage. That is was just as we started just uh, exposing a, a itch to the internet, uh, this plant. And now when we're looking at the model uh, for uh, cyber physical clouds uh, that we got there from that reference, we can see here that we've got our physical system. This is going to be depending on your applications, whether it is your water distribution system or power plant or whatnot, you have that physical system um, that is going to be monitored uh, using the sensors and uh, the sensor values are going to come over here into this cyber system, right? So you've got your physical system and your cyber system. If you had your, your normal cyber physical system, um, this could be, uh, this would be entirely controlled, obviously, by uh, the company or whoever owns this would have control over this and um, could be via a private network. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the same plant. Uh, we do have these distributed systems, so forth, but you'd have complete control over here. But what happens when you have the cyber physical cloud is some of this can be outsourced. In this specific model that is shown over here, um, everything was outsourced, right? So even the applications, what this cyber system is doing is in essence, just controlling, it's pretty much a mediator between the actual applications or the brains of the actual cyber system that is all happening uh, elsewhere. But obviously this is the, the, the most extreme case 
where the company has decided that they do not want uh, uh, any kind of responsibility to deal with this uh, at all, rather outsource that completely. But even here, we can see that uh, if, at, uh, if at any point the information, right, if the attacker comes in here and the information that goes over here where the decisions are being made, uh, if that is manipulated in some way, you're going to uh, have some problems. Or if uh, they can't uh, access uh, the actual applications as well, we're going to have some problems. But yeah, we will discuss the CIA triad um, um, as, as, uh, in the next slide as well. So, just because, uh, as Dr. Javi has been saying, has been saying in, the, in the previous presentation, just because now we've outsourced uh, the, the computing capabilities, irrespective of at which level um, have we um, outsourced this, um, we still do need to consider the three uh, key concepts of network security. Obviously, the cloud provider. Uh, would need to play their part, right? So the cloud provider will need to protect the information where it is and, and all of that. But also from the, the company's perspective, uh, there also needs to be some controls in there as well to ensure that all of this information is uh, protected uh, from the industrial control network uh, before it even heads out over into the, the cloud. When we're looking at confidentiality, the user data should obviously remain private, right? Uh, this is required by law. If ever you're going to be dealing with applications in these critical infrastructure applications, you're dealing with uh, data that is normally going to come from users, us, our, our data, and that would need to uh, remain private uh, by law. And also this could pose a security risk. And um, there were some researchers a few years ago who showed that in these um, um, uh, smart metering applications that are linked to these uh, uh, smart grids uh, as well. If the person is able to get the user data, they were able to see the use usage patterns of the, the user. And then from that perspective, they can see what are you doing uh, at home? Are you watching TV? Uh, are you making tea? Are you at home, right? So, and, 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 and the attackers would be able to see the patterns of, of the different users if they were able to get in as well. So we do have real world consequences. And obviously from a, an industry perspective as well, protecting some of your trade secrets, obviously we need to make sure all of that uh, 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 operational data is, is kept a, a secret so that uh, uh, unauthorized people on, are not able to access that. With regards to availability, we know that these cyber physical systems are real world, uh, uh, real time systems that are time critical, where even the smallest disease delays could be consequential for the system as well, right? So these are the easiest types of attacks to orchestrate, uh, your denial of service attacks. Uh, you don't really need any kind of uh, technical know-how, uh, uh, well, any kind of deep technical know-how. There, there are even a, 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 a attack patterns you, you can be buying somewhere and, 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 and compromised machines so that you could have these distributed denial of service attacks. These are very, very easy to orchestrate but also the easiest to, to detect, not only because it becomes evident that you can't access the information, but also from any kind of algorithm that needs to be detecting this, um, it's very, very easy to detect uh, this kind of uh, availability uh, kind of attack. The integrity attacks though, are, are, are a bit more complicated, right? So the system relies on accurate data in order to make decisions, right? So fabrication, so a person should not be able to fabricate uh, data or modify what's already there, or even replay old sensor values, because this could uh, lead to disastrous consequences. Uh, for example, uh, there were some researchers who showed that uh, replaying uh, old sensor values could fool the system into believing if you had like a water tank and the sensor and you have a a system that is ensuring that the tank never overflows. If you are able to replay these old sensor values, you could fool the system into believing that the water level is a lot lower than it actually is. And even if you know this is a legitimate packet, uh, but because it's old, it should not be considered as well. So these replay attacks are also as dangerous as well um, as everything else. And, and, and these integrity attacks are extremely difficult to, 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 to pull off. 
but also very dangerous. It's not impossible for them to be pulled off, especially in the case of these insider attacks. We saw from that uh, Maruchu water treatment facility, that could also be considered a, a, an insider attack uh, as well. So we saw how dangerous uh, uh, that could be uh, as well. So, but those are also very difficult to detect because an attacker with an intimate understanding of how the system could work would be able to make it such that it looks that, like the system is working normally, and then the fault detection mechanisms wouldn't be able, wouldn't even show up, and perhaps even fool the engineers into believing everything is still working as it should. Okay, so. Just uh, looking at time, let, let's just quickly go through this. That a, a compromise system is going to uh, lead to devastating consequences. So we should assume that the system can and will get compromised. Um, software vulnerabilities vulnerabilities are detected uh, every day. We saw the insider attack. What could happen with the case of Marucci? Social engineering attacks are also quite dangerous uh, because there's a new mantra going out from the hacking community where amateurs target systems professionals target people so your the users of the systems are the weakest link as an example the the start next worm against the iran nuclear program attacked uh, usually they, they tried many different approaches to break into the system the one that worked is well the, the working theory now was that it's a usb that one of the employees had brought into the system somehow got into the corporate network somebody and somehow we were able to get from there to the actual industrial control system and that caused untold damage to the, that nuclear program in the billions of dollars. Uh, that was that damage over there and, and it set them back quite a bit. So you can see that irrespective of, of that, people would be able to get in. So we do need a second layer of security, right? So what happens once a, 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 the, a, the, the defense perimeter has been breached? How are we going to be, uh, how do we react in that case? This leads us to our intrusion detection and prevention systems, right? So on the outskirts over here, we've got our preventative mechanisms, which are preventing unauthorized individuals from accessing system resources. But within the system, what we want is if these fail, right, we've got our intrusion detection and prevention system. So our intrusion dete detection systems, in this case, we want to detect an intruder that has bypassed the preventative uh, mechanisms, right? And we also have something else, which, which may seem counterintuitive, like which are called our intrusion prevention systems, right? And, and that's also within the system. This is not to be confused with our preventative mechanisms. And these um, attempt to mitigate damage of successful attacks through diversionary tactics and countermeasures. Uh, as an example, I don't know how many of you have heard about honeypots, right? Where you, you can have within your system um, fake system resources that seem very valuable, but that your normal users would not be able to access, right? So if somebody is in there, um, once they're in, they look at this file that says confidential uh, company files as a very extreme example. And, but we know that most people would not be, be accessing that from within the company, but somebody external may be able to access something like that. And they're going to go to this fake resource and it would al allow the company to be able, there'd be a flag that is raised when that happens and we'd be able to, to, to see what happens there. Okay, so when we get to these intrusion detection systems, uh, we've got two kinds, uh, broad categories. Well, there's a lot of mixed methods, but let, let's go to the, the, the two broad categories. We've got our signature-based methods and our behavior-based methods. The signature-based is we want to look, this works similar to how a virus scanner works. We look at particular attack signatures, we isolate them, we add them to a, a database, right? And once uh, we see that in our system, it's flagged as an, as an intrusion, right? And the advantages of this is that it's very fast detection because all you're doing is you're comparing uh, what is being done to the attack uh, signature. If you're seeing that, it's flagged. And this also has a very low false positive rate for that very reason. A disadvantage of this is it cannot detect unknown attacks. And as we know, attacks are evolving all, all the time as we're going ahead. So, 
it's it's pretty much a cat and mouse game if an attack has happened before it's added to a database a lot of people would be able to come in and 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 handle and 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 cause some damage there and the system would not be able to detect that right and we also have a need to maintain a database right the other approach is our behavior based methods and when we're looking at our behavior based methods it we are pretty much um looking at the behavior and seeing what is suspicious behavior without looking at what is an attack or whatnot what is considered normal behavior and what is considered abnormal behavior and that is pretty much what we're going to be uh, looking at there. and again here uh, looking at I'm not going to again here depending on how you're training it we're going to have some problems but in, in subsequent size we'll we'll look at that right but the advantage of this is it gives us the ability to detect unknown attacks because we're looking at what is normal behavior and what is not normal behavior so anything that is not normal behavior is abnormal uh, and this gives us the, the ability to detect unknown attacks and it also detects system faults as well by the way whether or not a, a, it's malicious is irrelevant it's a, it's it's something that is anomalous to the specific system and a disadvantage is you're going to have a higher false positive rate than the signature based methods over here but within these industrial control applications because of the consequences uh, we could argue that it's worth it worth it and we also have a, a slow detection rate there as well right let's conclude um this could be implemented at various different levels We've got the network uh, anomaly detection that could be implemented at the SCADA level. And this is dependent on the specific application. Are you working in a water distribution system? Is it some kind of manufacturing plant or an electricity, an electric, electrical grid plant or, or whatnot? Things like that is what we're considering here in network and anomaly detection. And this is independent of the vendor. Doesn't matter what computer or PLC or switch or anything you are using over there. It's specifically on the application and, and, and how that works, right? Then we have host anomaly detection, and this is implemented at a device level. And this obviously is going to depend on the specific uh, device information. What computer are you using? What operating system is being run there? What PLC are you using? Those are the kinds of things that are, are considered here. And this is completely independent of, on the, of the uh, uh, application. Uh, um, it, it's more on the device level to ensure that the device has not been compromised. Uh, and you, you should have um, host anomaly detection running um, over there. Okay, to conclude, the challenges are what went wrong. Right. So when we're designing these schemes, especially these behavior based systems that are going to involve some form of uh, machine learning, we're going to have our data. We chuck our data into an algorithm. The algorithm at the end tells us there has been an intrusion. We need to make sure that it's 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 not at that level. Where is the intrusion? What went wrong? We need to be able to find that information. There's also a lack of labeled training data. Right. In, in these cases, especially in the machine learning, how are we going to train our models? as well and test that it actually works uh, well because these simulated data is not necessarily going to be as 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 accurate as real world data so this lack of data needs to be considered as well in these environments the practical uh, the practical limitations in the application environment that's also a big consideration especially in these cyber physical applications where it's very time critical so we cannot have our anomaly detection system, exhausting system resources and affecting system operations because nobody is going to use that um, as well. And then there's also going to be the stealth attacks where the attacker is going to uh, 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 manipulate the data such that the built-in fault detection mechanisms of these systems um, can't detect this. Uh, and this could also uh, extend to these intrusion detection systems as well. So this is very, very challenging, um, a, a very, very challenging component as well that definitely needs to be considered. And yeah, that is that is it from my side. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I went over time a, a little bit, but thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, I'll take your questions as we go to the panel discussion.
Thank you for that, Dr. Daniel. That was a good presentation. Uh, it highlighted to the importance of proactively protecting the cyber physical systems by making use of intrusion detective uh, detection systems. Thank you. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Matthew Talliard. Mr. Matthew Talliard holds a BSc Honors Engineering degree um, in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of Cape Town. He's a certified information system security professional and is recognized as, uh, uh, as a professional engineer by the Engineering Council of South Africa. Matthew is passionate about operational technology, security, and has over eight years of experience working as an OT cybersecurity engineer for a large power utility. Matthew has experience securing critical infrastructure, IT, OT convergence, and cybersecurity strategies. Matthew now works with Fortinet as a subject matter expert for operational technology, cybersecurity to deliver OT cybersecurity solutions to customers across the continent. Please welcome Matthew, thank you. Hello everyone, um, hope you can hear me and see my screen. If not, just uh, give me a shout out. So um, welcome to this uh, um, presentation. I thought it was actually quite interesting. Um, as introduced, I'm the OT subject matter expert and I have uh, over eight years of um, uh, OT cybersecurity experience. And so when I, was, uh, when, when I looked at the theme for this presentation and saw it was um, putting OT data in the cloud, or applying that, um, instinctively I felt uh, um, just, just wanted to withdraw and go, no, no, that sounds like a bad idea. Why would you do that? Um, because that's kind of the culture in OT right now, or still is, is that um, we're still very reserved. We're still very, we want to keep, keep the data to ourselves. Um, we just now are starting to break out and converge in IT and OT. So I thought I would do a presentation around that. Basically, why would, um, what is the fear of um, trying out the cloud, going on the cloud and putting OT on the cloud? So if you're still not um, on, on, on board with, uh, with this idea of OT and cloud being talked about in the same sentence, then um, this presentation is for you. And if you're already on board, maybe you're a visionary and you see, see some uh, innovation that could happen here that could help your organization, uh, you may find it very difficult to convince others um, due to this resistance. So this presentation will also be interesting in how you could perhaps break down the problem um, and see how we could, uh, um, you know, see how OT could in fact be used with cloud. All right, so let's go move on here. Okay, so the agenda today is that we're gonna have a look at, uh, I'm just gonna cover what is OT and then in contrast, IT and cloud. I think it's very important just to once again, cover the, um, the differences between that and highlight the risks around that. Um, we'll then have a look at the threat of cloud and what it can bring about. Then we'll have a look at how we can protect ourselves. And then finally, is OT cloud possible? So first question I always get asked and I always like to share is that basically what is OT? What is operational technology? I have at the bottom there the definition from the National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST which if I quote there basically says that hardware and software that detects or causes a change to the direct monitoring and or control of physical devices, processes and events in the enterprise. So what, we, what is basically a very good um, understanding of OT is that when, when technology is affecting the physical environment and is infecting uh, human safety, it usually gets the OT tag. Uh, what I have on here is uh, four key verticals you'll very likely see to be associated with OT. We've got energy and utilities, transport, manufacturing, and smart cities. Um, for this presentation, I actually recommend you pick one um, from your side because you may be from a different audience. I'll probably be biased towards energy and utilities. It's my background, but you may be from somewhere else and feel free to do so and apply it during this uh, presentation. So what is the difference between IT and OT? Uh, this was touched on by a previous presenter, so I just want to make a few um, additional points onto that. Well, we can go back to the CIA security triad, which basically stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, and, and the main difference we actually see between IT and OT is that confidentiality is the top priority on the IT side. In other words, the key concern is data loss and privacy. But on the OT side, we kind of see it almost inverse and we actually see that availability is the top priority. So in other words, the impact to production um, environments and to the safety of, um, um, of the employees and, and people is the top concern. 
Um, this is basically why um, we have to understand that security is applied differently between IT and o OT to achieve the required priority. So we need to make sure that now that we've, if we're going to add cloud to the mix, we need to understand basically this priority of OT and how it plans to address that. So what is disrupting OT? Well, um, OT used to be very uh, happy in its little, little bubble, little air gap. And what used to happen is that something would happen, it would then get processed maybe by a PLC, and then it gets communicated back in some fashion back to the, to the device. And that was OT in a nutshell. It's very simple. Once something was constructed and built up, it was basically leave it alone, it works. Um, but over time, we're starting to see a need to basically bridge that gap between IT and OT. Um, the three common areas we are seeing from that is actually to optimize. So basically, um, we take data out from the OT side, we do something with it and feed it back in um, and optimize the plant. The second being is secure remote access. A lot of companies over the last um, year were now forced as, as this a requirement for the OT side because the workers had to work from home, but the business still needed to function. So secure remote access became a very key driver for businesses to actually um, bridge the gap between OT and IT. And I think finally is cost saving um, is that like instead of building two separate networks, one for OT and one for IT, why not put them all on the same network and save costs there? So these three combined uh, business, I think, factors um, have really started to disrupt OT and really saying, okay, we have to acknowledge um, IT and OT uh, convergence. So this, this is actually why, from my perspective, is that um, even, even as someone who is in the, uh, trained in the culture of OT would still say that security should come around and enable the business. So if the business is now saying we need to converge IT and OT, then we need security to help us do that, to help us use the technology and be able to do that. It's more than just uh, meeting compliance and being able to do encryption. Um, those, that's very important because that protects us right now, but also it might change the way that we do business. And now comes cloud. So the question is, um, what can we do with that? Well, the first, the first interesting question I'm going to propose to everyone is basically, um, well, how does this look at from the OT side? Uh, OT has control of its assets. It has control of its data. When the data now leaves IT, it's from OT to IT, it now, the OT owner doesn't have control over its data anymore. And that was one of the big problems that, that was really being raised initially is that once we open that door and we allow the data out, we don't have any control or monitoring over it. And when we introduce cloud, the same problem is there, maybe just with a higher risk. So now that we've opened up the doors for OT and IT, opening, and we already know that from that perspective, we don't have control of the data anymore. The same, the same factor, the same problem is also the same for cloud. So we can actually say now that there's not much real difference from the OT perspective where the data is going on IT or cloud, it's just a matter of some risk. And that makes it quite intriguing because it means that we could possibly, um, you know, realistically look at cloud as just another form of IT that we are now converging with. So it's important to remember that not all OT is equal. And it's another thing that I don't think a lot of people talk about, and it's something that I will address now in this uh, during this presentation. So keep this in the mind as well. Um, a lot, I come from a large organization background. So of course, putting OT with a large organization um, is, um, you know, has its own concerns, but not every, every organization is large. In some cases, we might have small to medium sized businesses who are, who are operate who are OT, but they will also um, be asking the same question, can we use cloud? So we've got some factors here to think about. Um, these were also touched on already with our previous presenters. So we've got regulations, we've got our data, our risk, the reward, and training. So we're going to have a look at all of these now going forward, and we'll come back to the slide and see what can we conclude, what can we um, think about with adopting cloud. So now the big question now is actually what is cloud? Um, so I've got two um, definitions there, one from Gartner and one from NIST. But the way I like to see it is that basically with IT, you know, the OT data was now sitting in the IT environment and we could go over to the IT owners and say, hey, are you protecting my data? Now with cloud, we're basically putting the data on with someone else. And that's a very broad um, oversimplification of it, but that's kind of what's happening. And that's why um, it, it provides so much more risk because now we don't know these people, what are they doing with the data? 
Um, if something happens, what do we do? You know, all these questions start running through your head. Um, but even with all that, the one thing that always stands out with cloud and what you always hear about is the opportunity. So cloud gives us, the customer, the opportunity to innovate and connect with, with the potential to reduce costs. So even though there's all these security risks that we're going to start talking about now, we keep coming back to it because of this opportunity. So let's see if it's going to be worth it. So maybe some free, uh, a few key things uh, are stats that I've noticed um, when we're looking at self-provisioning of uh, in cloud and the security challenges. The first thing here is from ESG, and they're saying that uh, um, the CIOs are reporting that from an assassin IIS security issue, um, for them, that is the top security issue from a cloud service perspective. So they already, so we can already see that CISOs, when it comes to cloud, they're very worried about it. They're very concerned about the security and the risk around it. Um, Gartner has reported that 99% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. I'm going to repeat that. I think that's very important. 99% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. Um, if you're looking for the problem, I think we found it. That's that's what I see from that statistic, and I and I think that makes sense. I, I mentioned on the previous slide that the opportunity of cloud is that you can innovate, you can do what you want to do and almost need to do to try and make a, um, to try and put an idea across. But at the same time, that might mean that however you've configured it or designed it or the architecture around it could lead to a security compromise. So this is becoming the key concern. So this is already the first thing to take down is that, yes, if someone's asking you, what about the security risks for the cloud? Um, this is this is really where we need to look at. It's mainly, mainly how are we how are we going to worry about the um, configuration? And even though with this kind of thing, there we're still seeing a massive growth for cloud. So again, the opportunity uh, for cloud is so great that people are still trying to find ways to make it work. So it's very interesting about that. Now, what I want to introduce here is the cybersecurity maturity scale. For those of you who don't know, this, might, this is something based on the CMMI and NIST. And basically, it's just a very simple way that you as an organization can create levels for yourself, um, define what they are for your particular type of organization. And that way allow you to audit against yourself and see basically where you are from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, so we usually see from here, this is more uh, passive, where it's basically more, your security is more reactive, like an antivirus, where once you have a signature, you can now react to it. And then you see where level four and five, we get to a more active approach uh, or proactive approach where um, security is more automated, more behavioral. That's how our previous presenter talked about. It's gonna, that's where you will see it. So my question is that when, in a traditional sense, you will be somewhere here and you can accept the risk and that's fine. So now my question is that if you suddenly go to an organization and now say you wanna add cloud, one question we could ask is that, what level do you need to be before you can consider cloud? Because you're going to increase your attack surface, you're going to increase, um, you're going to need also probably additional security for the cloud. So this also needs to be considered. And another interesting line we can see here is this exponential line is that as we move up the levels, security is going to cost more. So another key um, aspect to think about is whenever we're deciding to go or to consider cloud, we've got to think about is the cost going to be, so is the um, cost savings going to be worth it? based on the amount of extra cost we're going to have to occur, maybe from a security perspective and other aspects of that. So a very interesting um, idea to put down. Now we also need to touch on the multi-cloud. Uh, we've, we've spoken about cloud as a very, maybe it's just one thing, but in most likely the case, once you open the flood door to cloud, probably means that you're going to be speaking to multiple cloud infrastructures. And so now the question comes is like, how do you manage this? How do you secure data even between the cloud, let alone between your operations and the cloud? So you can see here, we've got the OT and its connections between IT. This is what we will currently be seeing now. And now he's saying, let's throw cloud now into the mix where IT can connect to cloud and maybe OT to cloud, or maybe it goes to IT and cloud. That will be up to you. But the key concept we have to think about is back to the security principle that data must be secured at rest and in transit. So if this is the global picture we're looking at, we've now got to secure it as such. But the big thing to think about probably now is how to audit yourself. That's probably going to be the best way you're going to maintain and remediating um, issues in the cloud. So there's three key points there that you could, um, that you need to talk around. 
And the idea is, first of all, is that you're going to need security tools both inside and outside the cloud. And by inside, I mean inside your organization. So you need OT security, you're going to need IT security, and you're going to need cloud security. So going into cloud is not a simple um, exercise. And I think that's the first major point to go across. And it would be detrimental to not consider security when going into cloud, because again, uh, we saw what the, um, what the risk can be. The second thing is that you're gonna need a cloud configuration management tool. I, I showed you that uh, Gartner statistic that 99% of the issues came from bad configurations. So being able to look at that, um, being able to um, not only um, uh, look at the configuration of a cloud infrastructure, but of a multi-cloud infrastructure. So some some security to have um, some security um, cloud security is a uh, some uh, cloud uh, you know vendors will have their native tools, but you may need a third party tool to look at everything. That's another thing to consider, and then also the same thing for CASB and it's uh, uh, to prevent misconfigurations for application uh, for SaaS applications and also need compliance. So those are the three things you need to keep in 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 the mind to protect cloud. So how do you audit yourself? Um, this is what it would take and make sure that you're protecting your data at rest and in transit. Getting back to that thing there. So now taking that audit account, I wanna now, now jump back to the slide and actually just think about now how it all fits together. So for me, how I feel is that for small to medium sized businesses, I actually think that they will need cloud. The OT small to medium sized will need cloud. I have a feeling that cloud, as we saw there, we're gonna find new innovative and different ways of doing business. And I have a feeling that small to medium sized businesses are going to be paying attention to cloud. They're gonna be, because they can be a bit more agile than large organizations, they can perhaps maybe take the time to, to figure out the, the right way to navigate this cloud infrastructure and make it work and provide unique um, solutions. We've been seeing it over the last five years, where, where small to medium sized businesses are coming up with revolutionary ways to do it. And I would not be surprised if those ideas start filtering into the OT side of businesses. Um, now for the large organizations, I think we can agree that I'm not gonna, they won't probably need it, but I think they could definitely benefit from it. Um, if you take data as an example, this was touched on by one of our presenters that not all data is critical. We could see that um, I, um, so like, uh, we don't have some non-critical non data that could perhaps maybe go on the cloud, like monitoring data. Um, that would be perfect for it to be able to go on the cloud, be processed and be readily available to anyone who needs it and be optimized um, would be a fantastic um, um, idea that we could see. And then I think we also need to touch basically on critical infrastructure, which we would see in our large organizations. Um, I, I have a feeling from a regulation perspective, this is not gonna be possible. Raw critical infrastructure data would probably never be allowed on the cloud. But there is possibility that we could find innovative ways to get it onto the cloud. As an example, uh, it's possible for us to perhaps maybe process the data, um, maybe scrub it of some way that we know it's resembling uh, critical infrastructure. And then now in a declassified state, or um, it can now go onto the cloud. So there's still clever things that we could possibly do that where we could start leveraging cloud in some way and we just have to get we have to understand what the regulations are um, how do we handle the certain types of data um, then look at the risk look at uh, how we can do that uh, make sure it's worth the reward because remember there's going to be probably an increase in cyber security costs to our organization to implement and then i think finally we have to touch base on this it was brought up by our previous presenter is the training um, I saw other stats also researching this, that training is going to be a big uh, need for companies. I would even argue that if you're looking for a new, um, you were thinking, what should I make a, a new, uh, new skill over the next three to five years? Get yourself a cloud one. It will not go unnoticed. Um, it was the most, uh, yeah, I've been seeing it all over. You won't go wrong with, it, with, with cloud. It is in high demand. So I think, I think that's, um, a summary of that, I really hope that um, this breakdown of what I've done will help you. Um, if you weren't on, if you weren't thinking like doing cloud for OT is not possible, I think it can be. And I think if you break it down like this for your organization, you will see that it actually is possible, that there might be some certain use cases where you can use cloud and therefore you need to take notice. 
And for those of you who are already on board in that, I hope this helped you break down the problem and think about it more ways and then help you convince and bring your idea to the table because I think cloud is going to play a big impact on the future. Thank you for your time. I'll hand it back to our host. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Matthew. That was a good presentation that showed us how security can, can in fact enable, can in fact be an enabler for business and how organizations need to consider their cybersecurity maturity level before even implementing in the cloud, as well as auditing their cloud environments accordingly as they go along. Um, we are now going to move on to the panel discussion. So I'd like to uh, welcome all the speakers back onto the panel and we're going to take a, a, a few questions uh, a, for all the, the panelists before moving on to the Q&A for the audience. So I would like to welcome Dr. Jabu back. Thank you for, for joining Matthew. We're just waiting for Daniel and Jabu, there we go. I'm not sure. Dr. Jabu, is your camera blocked? It's a uh, talk. Oh, oh, oops, yep, 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 it was blocked. Can you see <laughs> All me right, now? No problem. Yes, we can see you. We can see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for joining for for all your 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 speeches and uh, presentations. We really appreciate that. And now we're going to go on to the questions. I think I'll start with Daniel. And maybe the the first question we 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 have is maybe in the event that intrusion systems fail to actually detect an attack, are there actually any fail safe systems that can be put in place? What are these uh, layered security options that you refer to and how would they work? You know, maybe thinking about your explanation in, a, in terms of a defense in depth type of strategy. If, if you need me to repeat the question, I can, and, but uh, please go ahead. Okay, oh, sorry, I was mute. Okay, well, um, um, the, first, the first part of it is a, uh, um, the complementary system to the intru intrusion detection system is the intrusion prevention system that I that I also discussed, where you have a lot of uh, diversionary tactics so that when a person is in, right, even if they are not detected by the intrusion detection system, if, for example, you'd have a honeypot uh, somewhere within the system as well, right? If that person is able to access the honeypot, that could act as another way um, to detect that somebody is within the system. So these intrusion prevention systems that are, are going to try to make it as difficult as possible, even if the attacker is in there, you try to make it as difficult as possible for them to actually access particular uh, system resources, right? The other one is pretty much going to be the basics uh, of, of security. Um, uh, in terms of, for example, uh, access control and, and controlling, for example, if an attacker is able to get the credentials of um, somebody working in finance in the company, the credentials of that person should not be able to get them into the industrial control system. So this this whole thing, I, I can just make an example of this, 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 a friend of mine works for a company where the industrial control system only works on one password. Everybody shares the password, everybody's able to get in. Once you use that password, you can do everything in the system. That is not that is not that is not the, the way to do it. Everybody, anybody who has that password pretty much has everything. So it is going to boil down to the basics to give people only as much a, a, a access as they need, access rights as they need, things like things like that. So it's pretty much just going to be the, the basics and the complementary uh, intrusion prevention uh, systems as well. So yeah, yeah, those are those are some of the things. But but yes, I think I'd put a heavy emphasis more on uh, the basics of, of of network security, but also a consideration could be these. Uh, uh, intrusion prevention systems as well. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Daniel, for those questions. Just on a point, I just want to inform the the the, the guests and attendees that uh, you can drop your questions within the the questions tab. Please uh, do so, and then we will read out your questions. And you are welcome to direct them to a specific speaker, or you are welcome to just put them out there in general. It also has the option for you to to post the question privately if you don't want to to be identified as well. So that's also a possibility. 
And then thank you for the for that, Dr. Daniel. And uh, yes, I think yeah, this this whole situation of overprivileged users is is a bit of a an issue in, in, in many organizations, actually, not just industrial uh, organizations. I think then I will move on to Matthew. And I, I guess I want to ask, um, you know, the move from passive to active defense, right? Is this merely a, a technological consideration or are there other factors at play in the cybersecurity maturity scale? If so, what, what are these other factors? Hmm. No, excellent question. Um, so first of all, what is the difference between active and passive security? Um, it's basically, um, if you remember back on that graph I, I had there, level one, two, three is generally seen as passive security um, or defensive security. And that basically means we are, we were always reacting to the problem. Um, just like with an antivirus, um, you know, like once you have that signature, it then, then once it now knows the signature of the virus, so when we see the virus again, we react to it. That's what it's seen there. And then level four and five is generally reserved for the automation and the, um, the active security, the proactive security, the, the idea of saying, right, uh, let's, let's look at the behavior. Let's see now, are you doing something that you shouldn't be doing? And if so, then we're gonna, we're gonna sort you out, whatever that might be. It could be a blocking, it could be monitoring. That's, we have playbooks in play, we will do something. That's, that's what behavior is. So you ask now, is it mainly technology? And I would say technology is a gatekeeper going back to the people, process, and technology, just what our previous speakers have, have mentioned, is that um, those have to work together. So the technology enables you to start the, uh, the proactive security, but it doesn't end there. You then still need, it now says now as a, um, as a security operations employee, you now, you now don't have to now dig through logs all day now as a reactive approach now, the system will do it for you and identify where there are exceptions to the rules that you've made that now need your attention, making you more effective. That's the benefit to the business to invest into it. That's the benefit that you get and how you become more effective. And it's working that all together is the, um, is the approach, but it does start with technology. I hope that uh, answers the question. Thank you. Yes, no, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so basically technology is not the only factor. There are other factors in play and it's basically a holistic approach that you need to take as an organization in order to improve your security posture. Thank you for that, Matthew. Uh, appreciate it. I will then move on to Dr. Jabu. And then based on your presentation, I would just like to understand, you know, are there actual specific industries or verticals that are best suited for industry clouds or are the customized cloud options virtually limitless? No, no uh, thank you for the question, uh, Lengasi. So I would want to answer your question in two ways, it's a yes and a no. Uh, when it comes to a yes, you know, industry clouds, the, the, the way they were conceptualized is actually to target those industries that have sort of uh, been resisting to fully adopt the cloud due to the various you know, challenges that they may have internally, for example, as I indicated in my presentation, where you have these dynamic systems uh, within the, the organization, your IT, your OT, and maybe IoT. So they are best suited for those kind of industries. For example, you know, your manufacturing, your, your telecoms, um, and then of course the energy sector as well. But they are also very useful in organizations or industries such as government, you know, where there's quite a, a different security requirements uh, in, in different departments, for example, but also in the retail sector, you know, where you, know, you look at organizations that just take a lot that uh, would definitely need the cloud, but they may want, you know, to, to satisfy certain business requirements. Uh, so so th those would be very suitable to, for them, including obviously the financial sector, but, but ultimately, it also depends on the various models. For example, you know, the data models, as I, as, I, as I indicated earlier in my presentation. However, you know, industry cloud it, it is not so different to the normal cloud. It's just a matter of how it is customized to suit your business. Um, and and it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of specialized. So the, the use cases are sort of limitless. So it could be in agriculture, it could be in health. It will just depend, obviously, on the need. And, uh, and, the, and the specific uh, requirements that maybe an organization wants to meet that maybe the general the generic clouds uh, are unable to meet. Uh, 
All right. I thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, no, thank you for your answer, Dr. Jabu. I see you You gave a, a classic answer there where it's a, it's a sort of a case-by-case -case scenario, you know, it depends, sort of like a business school answer. So I appreciate that that answer, thank you. And then maybe moving back to, to Matthew, um, the other question maybe to, to consider is, are zero trust or is zero trust access something that industry should be looking into? particularly from an environment, uh, sorry, an industrial environment perspective? Yes, uh, good question. So first of all, to everyone listening, what actually is zero trust access or zero trust architecture? So in the OT side, um, we've gone, or was a very traditional aspect and even with normal with enterprises was, um, it's perimeter security. It's basically saying we put down those big firewalls at our perimeter, we're making sure we're watching traffic go in and out, and then we put down any other additional security as we need um, for internal on that. And there was a very um, biasum towards, if you're going to access you know, the company's data from the IT, IT, wherever, you would be inside the company and do it. This is also, I think, one of the big reasons why um, security, like, you know, like when you, when you were, uh, why business were requesting, like, or employees were requesting, like, can we work from home? And the answer is no. And one of them would be a security risk. You know, like you're not allowed to, you know, the date, the, the connection's unsafe to 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 get to there. You need to be in the in, inside our our organization. So now we've seen now that um, now that's no longer the case. We've now started taking in this approach of securing um, the connections, the, the the connections between the remote site or, or your remote laptop and to the organization and that. And this whole forms part about the concept of zero trust access or architecture where basically you don't trust where a person is, where um, you, whether you're in the business, outside the business, whether you previously had access 24 hours ago or not, doesn't matter. At a certain time intervals, based on the company policy, you will prove who you are, where you are, do you need access, um, everything based on what you want there. And that is the full concept of zero trust. So you can see from an IT perspective, that's very useful, you know, because of the remote access is a very key business case. So the question now is, does this now apply to OT? And I think I think the answer is yes. Uh, we just saw an example now of people saying, um, you know, all logging in with just one password and stuff. And that's that's one aspect of the AAA, the accounting uh, authentication and authorization. And building onto that now is the zero trust case of also saying, um, um, of saying now that we want to now control that access. And so uh, now that we are allowing IT OT convergence, which is now going to extend that now, now that we want to see more remote access to our OT engineers to access OT assets, zero trust access um, is becoming more of a, a business enabler of saying, now I don't have to send my, my engineer now to the site now, or my technicians, they, we can now access it now securely and remotely and be more efficient. So security is enabling the business now, using what has been perfected in the IT side, bringing it to the OT side and, um, and yeah, and now I'm doing much more than what they previously were. So that's why zero trust um, access and architecture is a big thing, and it's definitely applies to OT. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Matthew. I think yes, I agree with you in terms of the zero trust uh, approach. I think it's a very good approach for organisations to actually uh, manage their, their their security or at least improve their their security posture, so to speak. I'll then move on back to 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 Daniel. Dr. Daniel, just in terms of the overall benefits, are the overall benefits of the cyber physical cloud application worth the increase in the attack surface? Would it not be better to have just a normal traditional on-prem solution? Or is that thinking outdated? Okay, well, I'll, I'll answer it by, 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 by quoting two people, uh, right? I'll start with a uh, Professor Marwala from uh, the University of Johannesburg, who was giving a presentation, I, I forgot where, but he was pretty much going through the different stages of the industrial revolutions. And, and what he was saying is at every stage when there was a, when thing, there was a lot of change, there was a lot of resistance. Everybody who was resisting that change was left behind and the world moved forward, right? So it, it's not going to stop because you're saying that, okay, I, I don't think this is happening. The only thing that's going to happen is your organization is going to left, be left behind. Uh, what instead we should be looking at is how do we ensure that we're making this transition as secure as possible? And the, the second person 
I would quote is uh, Christopher Krebs, um, who was the former head of cybersecurity for critical infrastructure in the United States. And he said something similar after one of the more recent hacks, saying that we cannot stifle technological uh, innovation. What we should be doing is investing in security. We, they both need to grow at, at the same time. So saying we, we can't just say now this plant needs to operate the same way it operated 50 years ago because that is more secure. That is more, less efficient. Um, if we can improve the operations, the companies that are able to do that are, are going to have the edge and those that choose not to are going to be left behind. So, so I would argue that it, it is certainly not worth it because at some stage, uh, we are all going to need to, to make the jump. So it all depends on when the companies are willing to make the jump and whether or not they have invested enough in security to ensure that they have done so securely. Thank, thank you for that, Dr. Daniel. I appreciate the answer. I see as a true academic, you, you had some references in, in, in your answer. And I think maybe just uh, for the last round of questions in terms of the ones that I, I do have based on, on your presentations, I would uh, like to stay with you, Dr. Daniel, and then, then move across to the other, the other speakers. I, I want to ask, in your view, how would an, in, how would an intrusion detection system pro protect against a zero-day attack? Would this be based on the behavior-based method? And if so, can you please elaborate how the IDS and, and maybe even the IPS um, can, can assist with zero-day attacks? Okay, in this case, that's that's where the benefits of uh, the behavior-based methods, as you've, as you've just said, uh, are going to be uh, better than your signature-based methods. Because if you have your zero-day exploit uh, and, and somebody's coming in uh, before even they have been patched up or the, the signature has been added to the database uh, of the intrusion detection system. With the signature-based methods, you're not going to be able to detect that. But when we're dealing with behavior-based systems, we're actually looking at how the system is behaving, right? We're looking at, if we were to look at, at, at the example of the, 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 the Maruchi water treatment facility or any water distribution systems, we're looking at, we have particular sensor values, right? And the system is going to rely on those sensor values to make particular decisions. And there is going to be some dependencies there. So if we look at these sensor values, they're going to go into the system and we know that if that is the case, this is supposed to happen. Now, in the case of Maruchi, right, the, the person was remotely just able to log in and make these changes, uh, just make these changes as well, not relying on the system as well, because the system has to operate in a particular way. A behavior-based system would look at that as like, well, this sensor reading and that sensor reading, because you're not just going to look at one thing. Well, normally you'd say that if this system and you're taking in all of the, 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 the particular features that you're going to be using at that time, the system, if it's behaving like that, then the output should be X. If the output is not matching what the system normally behaves as, that is going to be flagged. So it doesn't matter how the attacker has accessed the system or, 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 or what they're doing. We're just relying on the behavior of the system. Is the behavior what we expect it to be? And if that behavior is not what we expect it to be, then we can flag that as an, uh, an uh, anomaly. So that, 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 I, I hope that answers your, your question. Yes, yes, no, it does, uh, Dr. Daniel. It's, it's a very actually uh, difficult topic because I think, as, as you mentioned, you can look at those, those behaviors and how they change. So now maybe there's an anomaly. But I guess the, the, the true thing is once you've got the, the patient that's sick, maybe you need to now check those symptoms to see what actually is the, is, is the problem and how to remediate from there. So I think it's, it's, it's sort of like a symptom to, uh, to how it helps identify symptoms for, for the professionals to then investigate further. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I will then move back to, to Mr. Matthew. And then my, my question is, the implementation of these various tools and technologies can result in increased uh, complexity and resource fatigue because we have 
multiple vendors, uh, multiple technologies, uh, softwares, etc., within the environment. What I would like to understand is, 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 in your view, can this be simplified in terms of uh, what you have in the environment? And if so, how, how would uh, companies go about, about doing that? Yes, so vendor complexity is definitely one of the biggest um, challenges for organizations. Um, if I look at, uh, I was reading Gartner's OT um, security paper um, that they came out with for 2021, and they actually mentioned that by 2025, 75% of organizations are going to be having um, their OT um, security integrate with their IT security. And by that, by integrate, but I mean that they can work together very easily. And I think the easiest way to do that is, of course, have it with the same vendor. So and now if you add cloud onto that as well now, that means like if you're a CISO or a CIO and you're thinking about security, you just want, okay, I want... I really just want to, to, to have a security vendor that can help me with the broad integrated automated approach for OT security, IT security, and cloud security. So that's probably what we're gonna see is this introduction of probably like a primary security vendor for the organization handling all of that. And then wherever the organization's niche, niche requirements are, then go out and say, okay, this is our primary security vendor. We need to solve this problem, but also take into account that you need to feed into this into this uh, secu uh, security solution that we already have. And may, that might be the best approach to, to simplifying it. So if we actually think back to that, um, that, CM, that cybersecurity maturity model that I had there, most OT organizations are not level one, most likely, because they're from AGAP. So the question now is that now, you've got to actually have a strategy in place, a cybersecurity strategy, um, as to, uh, highlighting to what your business plan is and how you're going to go forward with security. Um, develop your roadmap, which is going to tell you how you're going to, um, how much you can spend and where you want to be and so, such forth. And then when you start implementing, so say level one is like getting yourself firewalls, as an example, because you want segmentation, remote access. You then got to remember that it's more than just buying firewalls. You've got to start thinking, you also got to ask your vendors and say, okay, if we go with you, what does that mean for us, for our roadmap and our strategy for level two, three, four, and five? If they're going to tell you, you know, you're going to need to partner up with 10, 15 vendors, you've got to ask yourself, is that fine? Can, can another vendor do better? That, those are some of the key questions you're going to have to ask because at the end of the day, um, you might be fine for just level one, but next year comes around and now you've got to now start dealing with the consequences of those actions and implementing those security solutions and those products. So that's probably the key thing is have a plan in place, a strategy in place on where you are now, where you want to be, and ask your vendors, basically, if we go with you, what does it mean for us in the future? And that's how you're gonna really solve the problem of trying to reduce the vendor complexity by understanding what you do now matters. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that answer, Matthew. I think it's a, it's a prevalent uh, question, uh, or, yeah, a prevalent question and a, and a good answer because oftentimes these organizations just you know buy all this technology and in fact it makes them even worse they normally worse off uh than before because it's just such a complex environment they may not even have the right skills not everybody is skilled in those particular technologies so it, it just brings added complexity so that's an interesting approach uh in taking into account the maturity model i will then move on to the last question to dr jabu but before that i would like to highlight to the to the attendees to please drop your questions within the uh, within the question panel uh, on 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 the control panel for 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 anybody uh, that you'd like to to address or any questions you'd like to address. So, Dr. Jabu, the last question from my side is that you know the cloud service providers are selling us a dream, you know, uh, claiming high availability in different zones, embedded security features, etc. And not to say that that's not the case, but what what I would like to know is our industry is not creating a single point of failure by being too reliant on a on a single uh, cloud provider. And what measures can industry take to protect themselves? No, no. Thank you for that question, Langasi. Look, the, there's always the good and bad and the ugly in the, in the cybersecurity space. Or when you adopt, you know, any solution, uh, but basically. The cloud, on its own, I don't think it's a single point of failure per se. You know, when you adopt, let's say, you are using Azure or you are using maybe Amazon, the reason is those service providers obviously we trust them, and I think they have 
created a lot of redundancy, as you have rightfully pointed out. Their data centers are sort of uh, scattered across different regions. Uh, and, and this is good for them because they are then able to provide these services to these multiple industries uh, w without um, uh, uh, too much issues. But of course, I think anyone who adopts a, a cloud, particularly the industry clouds, because they're very customized, they need to be very careful of, of having their single point of failure. And that is why earlier on we were talking about, you cannot relegate you know, the operations and uh, the security just to the service provider because the service provider who is uh, serving you with your customized uh, cloud is also serving many others. So it's very, very key that uh, the issues of redundancy within your own environment they are taken into consideration in as much as um, uh, the, the cloud service provider would, 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 would probably assist you with that as well. You know, and um, the other key important aspect, obviously you need to look at the investments, right? Because uh, sometimes when you are in investing into a cloud, particularly the specialized one, you have to think about the issues of the, the, the skills as we have spoken about. And, and then the security as well, because the more clouds you have, let's say now you decide to have multiple clouds, you know, you want to have service provider A, service provider B, and service provider C, you must also understand that that also scales the cost, uh, because if you are using some specialized, uh, maybe let's say information systems, are you going to scale them across those different clouds, or are you going to use them in just one single service provider? But also in terms of the people that you might need to support you internally, you, you, you may want to you know, think about that carefully in terms of doubling it up. Because if you are now having, let's say, cloud A and cloud B, how is that going to affect your, your resource pool? Because uh, those cloud service providers you know, like Azure and, and AWS, they are using different technologies. They require different skills. You know, you're not going to necessarily get one person who might be able to, to, to do all of them. But also, you know, the issues of business continuity is very important, particularly when you speak about uh, the single point of failure, that when you get into an SLA with the service cloud provider, you understand fully the issues of, uh, you know, business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, what happens, you know, when there's um, uh, issues of power failure or there's a, there's a, and we have seen this, for example, with big companies such as Google, that it can happen that the whole continent might lose the service. But what happens uh, in that case, especially if you are a very specialized uh, service provider, maybe let's say like the health sector and, and, and stuff like that. So ultimately, the, the last point I want to make is that when you are implementing some of these things, it's very important not to be blindsided by maybe the goodness of the technology or also just get scared because it's in the cloud. You have to think about security holistically and as we have spoken here, you know, you have to think about the risk, you have to think about the threats, you have to think about your context. You also have to, 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 to think about what is it that you really want to protect. Think about your partners, the vendors that you are working with, how are they helping you and so on and so forth. Because ultimately security is a multifaceted, you know, a beast. It's not just a one size fit all. Sure. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Jabu. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as you clearly put it uh, so eloquently, it is a multifaceted thing that we need to to consider, and that you know these these organisations such as these service providers have made uh, put measures in place to address these things. But there's also work that needs to be done by the organisations in order to to address these concerns and improve their their security posture. Thank you to to the panel. I'm now going to move on to questions that uh, have been posted in the chat by our attendees. We've got one question here directed to Matthew by, by Donald. The question is, does the size of the organization impact the choice of selecting cloud type? For example, uh, uh, DRAS, D, uh, B, BAS, SEKS. Okay. Thank you, Donald. Uh, Donald, I'm not, a, I'm not a cloud security expert, so I'm not going to be able to answer that question, but I could definitely predict um, that the, um, the, the, the size of what you want to do and the intent of what you're going to use for is going to matter. Um, maybe I, I can hand it over. I don't know if there's anyone else on the panel who might have a bit more of a uh, familiarity with that, but yeah, I, I definitely think it's going to have some impact, but I, can't, I won't be able to go into any more detail because I'm not an expert on that. Sorry, but thank you for the question. 
maybe we can open to the rest of the panel. Would anyone like to attempt uh, that question? I'll repeat it. Does the size of the organization impact the choice of selecting cloud type? For example, DRAS, BAS, SECAS. I think I can I can try and answer that. Obviously, you know, size matters, um, including whether you are going to choose private, public, what services are you going to be having? Is it going to be hardware? Uh, well, let's say maybe platform as a service. Is it going to be infrastructure as a service? Is it going to be just software as a service? So, so, so ultimately the type of the organization and the size of the organization plays a very huge role in, in, in the type of cloud that we are choosing because that will also uh, you know give an indication of whether uh, you want to take everything into the cloud or will it just be the data component or will it just be some application component and stuff like that um, and also it depends where is this company operating right i think that's very very important because some people don't realize you know that if your company, for example, is operating within South Africa, you need to comply with certain laws. If it's operating within the UK, you need to you know, comply with certain laws in Europe, like GDPR and stuff like that. So when you adopt the cloud, it's also very important to think about those things. But ultimately, it's also determined by your vision or strategy and what is it that you want to achieve. Um, and then obviously, there are some applications, you know, like in government, they have uh, very legacy applications that even if you wanted to choose them, they may not necessarily operate uh, in the cloud. It might take a little bit longer or it might be more expensive. So definitely size do matter. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Jabu. I hope that answers your question, Donald. Thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, just to confirm, Minx, uh, I am in the questions tab. I'm not seeing any other questions. Is that correct? Are we seeing this today? That's correct, Lenga. <clears throat> All right. Uh, just just a, a, a quick one to uh, to the attendees, just in case you do want to ask any questions, maybe you can drop a, a, a question there. Please note you can drop them anonymously as well. So we'll just uh, check uh, in the next if there is anything else. Otherwise, we will. Okay, you're welcome for the response, uh, Donald. Uh, thank you to, to Dr. Jabu and Mr. Matthew for, for their answers. We'll just uh, give it a second, uh, two minutes, one minute. Alengezi, maybe while we uh, wait, maybe I can just make one final comment. That's okay? Okay, yeah, yeah, please go for right. it. Yeah, uh, thank you. So maybe just one last thing from my side, because um, I think we're gonna be done soon is that um, uh, I always see security as um, a, a means to enable the business. It's, it's more, for me, it's more than just um, doing encryption and meeting compliance and, oh, we need to have this sort of thing here. Um, by, by actually putting in the right security for your organization, you can change the way you do business. And no bigger example of this was the fact of how we can now work remote from home. I think this has definitely been the biggest culture shock we've seen from this. Um, you know, similar to like when we saw emails come in, it changed the way we do things because not only did we get the new technology, but we secured it correctly. And um, I think the theme you saw here today is that OT has challenges, yes, but cloud is going to, um, um, just like IT is coming to, to help change the way we do business, so will cloud. And um, maybe we should really just think about rather not, um, I think the future questions for this next decade will not be um, if we should use cloud for OT, but rather how and to what extent that we use cloud for OT. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Matthew. I think uh, based on the fact that there are no questions, I'm, I am going to just uh, say my final thoughts. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank all attendees for actually joining, um, as well as a special thanks to our speakers. Uh, this uh, a reminder, this event will be available on the SAE TV YouTube page. Uh, they, there's usually about uh, two, three weeks before it is available on there for, for viewing or download. And um, I would just like to also reiterate that uh, this, this, this was a very interesting conversation. As, as we can see, the cloud does add a layer of complexity, but there's also a lot of opportunity for organizations to take advantage of when it comes to implementing the cloud. And I'd also like to urge um, all individuals to maybe consider upskilling themselves in the cloud. And particularly when it comes to the industrial environment, you know, we'd like 
for 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 the engineers uh, to to develop cybersecurity skills and 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 aim to to assist with the critical critical infrastructure within the country as well as just industrial uh, environments. As those skills are necessary, when you understand that environment, you're better able to adapt. And uh, as you can see, there's cybersecurity. There's a lot of opportunity there. So if people want to make career changes, it is a, a place of of interest, and many organisations are actively recruiting people in, in, in that space. So I, I just wanted to reiterate, reiterate that. And once again, I want to thank everybody. A special thanks also to, to Minx for organizing the event as well as SAE um, and, and the other cybersecurity chapter members that uh, helped organize the event. And uh, once again, a special thanks to the, to the speakers. We really appreciate your input, your knowledge, and uh, I bid you all a, a good night and thank you for everything. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you, Matthew. So Thank you, Daniel. Cheers.